So today, what I want to do is to begin by talking a bit about the context of this text and of Aristotle's life. Talk a little bit about the Platonic background against which Aristotle works, including Aristotle's relationship to his teacher Plato, and then spend most of my time on the architecture of Aristotle's view, only dipping into the text at the very end and focusing on the text in detail in the next two lectures. So, let's begin with a bit of context. Aristotle himself, of course, lived in Greece. He lived from approximately 384 before the Common Era to 322 before the Common Era. And he was clearly an aristocrat, a citizen of Athens, and a member of a reasonably noble family. He studied with Plato at uh, Plato's Academy and was, of course, Plato's star student. And after graduating from the Academy, he became the tutor to Alexander the Great, who, of course, conquered the world. That's a pretty good lineage, Plato, Aristotle, conquer the world. Besides being Alexander's tutor, he taught at his own academy called the Lyceum in Athens for many years. Late in his life, he had to flee Athens um, because he was charged with impiety. Now, of course, you know that Aristotle was not the first Greek philosopher to be charged with impiety. That's the charge on which Socrates was tried and executed. So Aristotle, not wanting, as he put it, the citizens of Athens to commit a second sin against philosophy, fled Athens and died at the age of 62 in Chalcis. Plato, of course, is most famous for writing in a dialogue form. Aristotle also wrote dialogues, and he wrote quite a bit apparently. Unfortunately, none of Aristotle's own texts survive. Even though we have a large Aristotelian corpus, all of that corpus is in the form of lecture notes. But at least his students took good notes. So this is a bit of the context. Aristotle's teacher, as I said, was Plato. And Aristotle also established as a wonderful um, precedent in the history of Western philosophy. Because very often we think that students inherit their teachers' views and propagate them. Aristotle showed that that needn't be so, and that the best philosophy emerges when a teacher actively is criticized by his students. And so we find that whereas Plato emphasized the abstract and the ideal, argued that the material world is not nearly as real as a perfect world of forms or concepts, whereas Plato argued that we have innate knowledge and that sensory knowledge is all kind of confused, Aristotle focused on the importance of sensory knowledge, argued that all of our knowledge is acquired, argued that the theory of forms doesn't make any sense, and provided a completely opposite philosophical view from that of Plato. And so one of the really lovely things about Aristotle's place in our Western tradition is he really inaugurates this tradition of active critique of one's own teachers and generates this um, ideal that we have in the liberal arts tradition of academic debate rather than simply parroting what one has been taught. So for that reason, I really adore Aristotle's work and Aristotle's life. So now what I want to do is to turn a bit to the architecture of Aristotelian philosophy, and within that architecture, we'll talk about the architecture of his ethics. We're going to begin with a discussion of Aristotle's view of the soul. And before we do that, I think we need to talk a little bit about the term, because even though the Greek term anima is translated as soul, the word soul has acquired in English um, enough theological and metaphysical baggage that I think that it's actually come to be a kind of bad translation of the Greek term anima, which is what Aristotle is talking about. Now, you don't have to be a brilliant philologist to see that the word anima is related to the word animal, to the idea of being animated. The anima is that which animates something, something which gives it life. It's not some immortal thing that's the basis of action and good and evil. It's not something that travels between lives or that survives the death of the body or anything like that as far as Aristotle is concerned. The, when Aristotle uses the word anima, he simply means the kind of principle or set of processes that makes us different from rocks what it is that gives life to something. So we might better translate anima as life principle. On the other hand, the word soul has become so entrenched 
in Aristotelian um, translation that it would be weird to use a different term. So I'm going to use that word soul, but wherever I use it, you're going to be conscious of the fact that it's translating the term anima, this notion of that which animates something. Now, Aristotle wasn't just a philosopher. He was also a mathematician, a logician, and a biologist. And in fact, he undertook biological expeditions where he collected samples of animals and plants from various places in Greece and wrote about biology. And Aristotle's view of the soul, of the anima, is a very biological view. He's worried about what animates things, and he thinks of those in scientific terms. It reflects the fact that Aristotle thinks of human beings primarily as natural objects, as one sophisticated kind of animal, not as spiritual beings whose minds are in direct communion with abstract forms, as his teacher Plato thought of us. And so Aristotle argued that the anima or the soul, this principle, has a number of different layers that we can think of as from the most primitive to the most uh, sophisticated or recent. And you can actually see a lot of the roots of modern biological thinking in Aristotle's account. I mean, not literally modern, but you can see the roots. So Aristotle argues that the simplest, the bottom level of the soul, is what he calls the vegetative part of the soul. That's the part that's involved just in growth and nutrition and the um, absorption of energy from the environment. And Aristotle argues that plants and animals all share this vegetative soul. It's a principle of life. Again, don't think of it as a mind of some kind. Think of it simply as what makes us work. So the fundamental level is this vegetative level that simply enables us to be living processes. Above that, Aristotle argues, is an appetitive soul, an appetitive um, anima. That is the one that gives us appetites uh, for food, for water, sexual appetites, and in general, desires. And of course, that Aristotle thought was a level of soul, a level of anima, and is distinctive to animals, but which plants don't, um, don't share, um, this kind of appetitive uh, soul. But some animals have an appetitive soul, Aristotle thought, but not a sensory anima, a sensory soul. Very primitive animals, maybe mollusks or things. And the next level of soul that Aristotle recognized was a sensory soul, the, se the aspect of our life that makes it possible for us to see, hear, smell, and so forth. That's a higher level of um, organization, if you want. And above that, Aristotle argued, was the locomotive soul, the part that's responsible for motor control, that allows us to move around. That's something that we share with most animals, but Aristotle pointed out not all animals, some can't move, but most can. And finally, and unique to human beings, Aristotle argued, was the rational soul, the rational anima. Um, and that's the part of the soul, the part of our principle that enables us to act, that allows us to think, that allows us to use language, that allows us to reason, that allows us to understand. And Aristotle argued that that is unique to human beings. Now, whenever we think about Aristotle's moral philosophy and Aristotle's account of what a good life is, which is where we're going to be spending the next few lectures, we want to think of it in the context of this understanding of what it is to be a human being.